Hello and welcome to the next episode of the D4H Bravo Zulu live streaming series. Um, today we're going to get stuck into our own product, D4H Incident Management. And um, we're going to cover it off from a perspective of, perspective of search and rescue. Um, couldn't think of many better people to do this with us than Kyle Van Delft. So I'm going to bring Kyle in here to the chat. Hey, Kyle. Hey, Robin. Good to see you. And you. So uh, oh, Kyle and D4H go back a long, long way. <laughs> um, I, I'm guessing Sarsine. Yeah, no, I think it was yes. uh, was Sarsine that I first met you and uh, dove into the software. Got really excited about what uh, what the potential was there for for my home SAR team, and uh, and yeah, started using it almost right away after that. So, so Kyle is one of our absolute um, pro users, uh, masters of of D four H, to the point that he ended up working them with us, uh, working with customers doing implementations, and then uh, helping out on the help desk. Uh, for quite a while, a long time, has been over to to us in Ireland a couple of times. Um, the um, Kyle, what? Tell me a little bit first about your your home search and rescue team. You do you volunteer in search and rescue, and you're also a professional uh, with Parks yeah. Canada. So tell me a little bit about exactly. your home team first. So I, I've been volunteering for for search and rescue in British Columbia here for ooh, I guess almost fifteen years now. Um, started when I was uh, was quite young at sixteen years old, um, taking care of gear, sweeping the the bays, making sure that everything was was rescue ready, and have uh, have moved on into a number of different roles provincially. Um, currently, right now, I sit on the the board of directors for the BC Search and Rescue Association. And then on the the other side of things, the professional side of things, I work as a uh, a rescue technician for our national park service here in Canada. Excellent. Tell me a little bit. You Parks Canada, you've you've been out on Vancouver Island, is that right? For a little while. Yeah. So primarily, I uh, I work as a rescue technician on the West Coast Trail, uh, west coast of Canada. It's a seventy five kilometer hiking trail, and we do roughly seventy five to a hundred incidents every summer and mm -hmm. i'm actually I'm, i've taken a new position with parks canada here and i'm going to be moving up to up north uh to the arctic to to help develop the the rescue program for a new national park that's been created excellent and so you were just telling me we were chatting in uh, as they call it the green room before this uh i was saying this new community you're going to is fly in fly out only so no more cars you're uh you got to fly there to get or fly out to visit yeah, people. Exactly. I'll, uh, it'll be a trip on my dog sled, but uh, no, it's going to be a, <laughs> a great time. It's a uh, newest national park in the, the Canadian <clears throat> in the Canadian system. It's about uh, fifteen uh, thousand square kilometers, so a uh, pretty big territory to take care of and uh, yeah. to develop a program for. Uh, what are the primary activities happening in that park? What, what are the yes, risks the, from a search and rescue side? Totally. So it's half of the park is marine. Um, whether it's the the Great Slave Lake, uh, lots of fishing there, and then tons of uh, of small lakes, rivers for for canoe trips and, and long multi day canoe trips. So lots of water activities um, is really the the primary there. So lots of lots of marine reuse, both large lake and then some of the smaller rivers and lakes as well. So uh, yeah, and what does to what what does putting together a rescue sort of program mean? What what does that look like? Yeah, so it's it's everything from i mean the very beginning of it is if we can we can avoid um people getting into trouble that's mm -hmm. the the best thing is if we we don't have to do a rescue so lots of search and rescue prevention lots of education and then preparing the the rescue side of things as well and because it's a, a new park um we're getting get, everything's getting started is that's everything from the actual procurement of the rescue vessel through to training staff in, in how to operate it and then the actual rescue itself fantastic what happens there at the moment is there a community team of some type or yeah, it's 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 community led. Um, quite a bit of it by the the local police department as well. Mm -hmm. um, but now that Parks Canada is coming in with this new national park, we take over the jurisdiction for that region. So, be working Fantastic. working closely with the community as well. So, so to you, a, a lot of your uh, my understanding of uh, certainly your your search and rescue work so far would I be saying in e either injured or crag fast uh, folks in the mountains or mountainous 
environment or in marine environment. What, what's your typical SAR call that you're used to? Yeah, SAR is, it's really been across the board through through my, my volunteer career as well. I mean, I think back to when I first started in search and rescue in the, the Rocky Mountains, um, that's a lot of a lot of wilderness search, um, injured or missing people, overdue, mm -hmm. um, and then the the winter and avalanche response that comes with that. And as I've I've moved around the province, um, currently living near Victoria on Vancouver Island, um, we've switched into more of a an urban search, so Alzheimer's, dementia, um, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been a, a really good cross section of, of search and rescue incidents that have been involved in through my my volunteer career as well, um, mm -hmm. which is is really I think leads well to how I've been using and how my team has been using um, the incident management software is because it's so robust and so customizable. Is it it makes it usable for anything from that urgent avalanche response in the mountains through to that two or three day search looking for um, an Alzheimer's patient who's walked away from a care facility or gone missing. So because the, the customizability is there, um, there's so many tools that we can we can build in and make for ourselves within the software. That's where I was really excited to, to start using it a number of years ago. And in turn, like you said, to, to work with you guys for a while and help other SARD groups and other other responders around the world realize how how this tool can be used for their day to day. Excellent. So we're, we're going to bring up um, a, a demo search and rescue account uh, that we have here. We'll bring it up on screen share. And Kyle and myself are going to talk through an incident as if there was a, a, a rescue or missing person to do um, and control it together. So we're, we're both in it. And um, before we do, there's one last question here, which is what is the national park you're going to called? Yeah, so the, the new national park is in the Northwest Territories of Canada. It's called Tai Dinanene National Park Reserve. And that's uh, translated into the land of the ancestors. Excellent. Very good. So it's right up, you were saying near Yellowst Yellowstone? Is that right? Near Yellowknife. Yeah, Yellowknife, so sorry. Of course. Northern, Northern Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Okay, brilliant. Okay, let's bring this up. So uh, you should see my screen. That, uh, Kyle, you got my screen? Yeah, I've got it there. Oh, okay, uh, I think we can make it as big as we can. Okay, so uh, what's going on here? I'll just quickly introduce this. Let me uh, try and get some of the uh, clutter off the screen. Um, what you're looking at here is the, the landing page, and this is going to show any active incident going on. So uh, you're going to be, uh, where should we put it in? We'll put it in BC. We're currently where? Near, near your home Sounds team good. now. Right? Okay, so, yeah, right here, Victoria. Yeah, so we're going down here. So we're just on the U.S. Uh, Canadian border here, um, and this is Kyle. You're hit here. Are you here at the moment? Yeah, right in there. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so this is what it'll look like, and you'll see any active, ongoing incident uh, happening. Now we're going to hit start new, so I'm going to do that, and you'll see coming up on my screen are my list of plays. So these are scenarios you can pre-build, and when you pre-build a scenario into here it lets you uh, sort of uh, template out what status boards you want, what checklists you want to complete, what documentation you want to open, what ICS structure or, or command structure you will have uh, for that type of rescue or incident. So we're, I'm just gonna hit missing person search and I'll just call it missing person search. Okay, so what happens now, it, it forms a new channel for us to deal with this incident in. And uh, Kyle, probably on your screen, on your side, this has popped up for you. Uh, I'm sure you're able to join us in here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What we'll see, I'll click personnel here, and we can see now both myself and Kyle are both online. So that's what the green dot means here. So back on the situation, uh, we're just going to put this as high urgency. And bear with me here now. What we'll do is, um, Kyle, we might... We'll step through this together, okay? So could you set the location for us? Yeah, absolutely. So Kyle's working through, he's, he's able to edit the location field while I'm filling in another field. So I'm just gonna give it task number one, two, three, four, five. And you can see I'm editing that field. And we should see the location pop up. And I'll say it was the police tasked us. And the police number was five, uh, four, three, two, one. Sorry, it's police here. And then um, 
say John Smith and his phone number. Okay, so you can see here, Kyle's me meanwhile filled in the location. All right, so we know at this point where oh, this incident is, and we cancel that. Okay, um, Kyle, could you fill in numbers, subjects, incident type? I'm going to start filling in the description, and you should see them, and maybe you'll get down to weather and an urg urgency analysis. So I'm typing in here, uh, we have two persons missing on the mountain, um, and the patient unknown. And you can see here, Kyle, fill in search. Maybe you could just throw in some weather there, Kyle. And I'm now going on to, I'm skipping over Kyle here. I'm going to say uh, we've got their difficult terrain, poor weather. Okay. So you can see here together we filled in this form. It's a little bit like if you've used Google Docs or Google Sheets with people at any time. That's kind of the experience. So um, you can see each other working on the form. And we can now take this form. And I go up here to the top. And I can do things like print it, share it by email, share it by public link, all of those pieces. Okay, so I'll just do a very quick example of a print. And and while Robin's printing that, I think the the key piece to to this and really as you've seen as us being able to to edit this form together is especially right now during COVID is we're not necessarily able to come together as a full complete incident management team, but uh, but to be able to to collaboratively develop all of the the planning documents that we need is is incredibly beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. So this is all typically branded up with the team or county name. Um, what we've got here is just an, a demo account. So let's. I'm going to load back into this channel, um, having printed that, and now we've got. I've got a an email copy gone to the whole team as well. And we're going to get an update and information. So I'm just going to put change this just to persons, just uh, so we can change this field. So what I'm going to do here, while if I hide the menu and open on the right-hand side, the log, the audit trail, I'm going to change number of subjects to three. And over here, you'll see Robin change subjects from two to three. Kyle, could you change that field to four? Let's say we get new information, there's four missing. And you can see here now, Kyle has changed from three to four. So every piece of information, every field, everything in here is logged on audited. So we know when we got information, who we got it from, and what role that person was in when they gave it. We now have to find what we're doing. Kyle, we might jump onto the roles section next. For sure. So this is where we're going to start to lay out who our team are. And Kyle, we'll make you the IC. So I can go in here and set Kyle. And I'll do planning. And we can add any anyone else. So on the fly, I could go in and say we've got a safety officer and I can add a new person that doesn't they don't all have to have user accounts. Um, I'm going to say Paul Kelly is here. And you can see I've added another person within our ICS structure. Of course, we might want to get into our 207. So I hit the org chart here on the top right. And you can see here the same data all laid out. And I can print this, pull it into my 201. There's lots of pieces we can do with these org charts. And the really cool thing there is that if, if you're more comfortable with the org chart, then you can add the data there instead of going down that list. So they everything talks to each other, everything's gonna gonna populate as it goes. So now I'm on the, the personnel screen and I can see that as soon as Robin added himself to the operations chief, it's made that change on my side here. Kyle, so we can see this working in real time. Could you drag out the ground director and just have him reporting to me? So you'll see the box here up here beneath, beneath me as operations chief. Oh, sorry. Two seconds. Had it in the wrong spot. There we go. No problem. There we go. So 
Kyle's adding this. So I'm doing nothing here, and you can I can actually see this drawing. I can draw at the same time if I wanted. Okay. So really, really um, um, real time and collaborative between us. Okay, fantastic. So we've got our 207 coming together. Now we know the situation we're dealing with. We know the roles that we need to respond to this situation. And we're starting to assign our resources, our people to this. Next, we're gonna start stepping through maybe some of our incident action plan, uh, building out an IAP and filling in some more detailed forms like subject, subject profile. So we'll jump onto subject profile first. And let's have a look. It's automatic so you can link fields back and forward here. So you can see we've got the task number and name already filled in. And uh, Kyle, we'll just very quickly, uh, we'll jump through here together. Um, You can see I can upload photos, drag and drop a file on. Okay. So very, very easy. And we're starting to fill in this subject profile. One of the really nice features here, once we're done with this profile, obviously I've got all the same pieces, share it, create a public link to it. Uh, take a snapshot of it. There's loads of stuff I can do here. Add my photos to it, but I can also sign it off. So on the bottom here, you see approved by. If I click this, I can try my best at my signature here. Easier on your tablet or phone. Okay, and sign and lock document. And that form is now locked. So it's signed by me. I'm the operations chief. And Kyle, you shouldn't be able to edit that anymore. Absolutely. As soon as you sign that, um, it's locked on my side as well now. Great. So we can take this and again, I can print it, share it, uh, and that subject profile is locked. Okay. So we're done here. Let's uh, just have a look in. So you can have all of your ICS forms. You can build out folder structures for each um, operational period. Um, and you can build any form you'd like. So it's, it's endless how much you can customize this. And it's, Kyle, it's pretty easy to edit the templates, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is where <clears throat> some of the, the key features to the software is, is if you have a different data field that you want, if you have a completely different form that you want, if you want to call it something, if you want to call a data field something differently, um, quick and easy to do that. And and on the, the actual form development side of things, it's literally just creating new data fields and dragging and dropping to, to create and develop your form. If, you, if you're comfortable, um, you can make some of those changes on the, the coding side of things as well. But for, for most people and for myself, absolutely, it's, it's quick and easy just to, to click and, and create a form. Yeah. So um, let's have a, we'll take a quick look because it's a really good example. So you can see here under equipment, uh, we've got ch a checklist field. So um, let's see if I wanted to add another field in here called objective. So I'm on my 206 medical plan uh, and to, sorry, actually let's do uh, travel time to hospital, just as an example. So uh, I'm gonna put it between equipment and other. So I'm gonna jump into the admin area and all accounts who use D4H have full self-service access to the admin area. So I go into templates, I go into form templates, and it was my medical plan 206, I edit that. And I said that this template, and of course you can create templates from new as well. So these little plus symbols are showing me where I'm gonna add a new field. So to the right of equipment, I'm gonna add one called uh, hospital transfer time. And you can see I've added the new field and I can pick the field type. I'm gonna say it's a numeric field with minutes as the unit. And I can pick text fields, text areas, drop down, check boxes, all the different field types. So that's it's that simple to add and add the forms. I hit save at the bottom. Let's go back and have a look at our form. And in fact, this is already live. It has been pushed out already to all of our mobile apps. It's 
been pushed out to um it's been pushed out to all our mobile apps it's been pushed out to kyle and myself here so kyle could you fill in the hospital transfer time okay 22 minutes and you'll see if i had an update i can change it and everything's audited tracked and logged okay so that's one of the one of the oh sorry yeah go ahead yeah, one of my favorite features about the, the forms, especially when we start getting into longer operations, is the the date or the time or the task number, or the, the incident name, is if you're handwriting those or even typing those out, that becomes monotonous after a, a full two or three operational periods. So one of the cool things with the forms as well is you can set up relationships. So um, all of that data that we have in the situation form, so our, our incident name is going to all pre-populate into some of this if we set that up as a, as a relationship field, which is, again, for, for the people creating all of those forms, incredibly helpful to, to have. Absolutely. Okay, brilliant. So next we've run to our map. So we kind of starting to have a feeling now we know what we're doing. Let's uh, go down here onto this. So you can see here we've had we've all our different layers. So you're going to see as we work through our scenarios, clues, assignments are going to start populating. We've also got our base maps. So built in are all of the Esri base maps. Okay, um, but you can add your own. So for example, here I've added open topo maps. So you can define any base map layer you'd like, um, and you can use that. So there's open street map and open topo map. Let's just go into the Esri topographic. Okay. But you can also see here, we could go imagery. Oh, you've got some nice uh, black and white imagery there. Let's see if it improves as we go in. Oh, I wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> All locations you can pick. It's color next Nothing door, but right? the best. Yeah, look, you're black and white just on that point. That one square oh. you picked, Kyle. <laughs> uh, let's, I'll just have a look. Oh, yeah, as we go in, it's going black and white. So the layers are just whatever is provided by uh, Esri. It's their um, set of base map layers. So we can also add our own overlay. Um, so in here, you can add an image overlay, put your own mapping in, or subscribe to your own base map. Okay. No, and we that, can... that image super cool opportunity as as technology starts to to grow and and change um, for search and rescue and for response as a whole, is I think this is a key feature for for um, urban search or for swift water technicians getting into a river, is you're able to to fly the the UAV down the river, do a safety check of that river, look at any new log jams, any new hazards, and then overlay that directly onto your map here. So instead of looking at topographic or or satellite imagery that's weeks months years old you've got an image from this morning when your uav operator overflew that river so super helpful to be able to have live up-to-date information in your in your planning map here yeah absolutely okay what we'll do here is let's start drawing out some uh, areas so normally this Im imagery is in color but we'll, we'll work with it so um what we'll do here, let's, I'm gonna add, I don't wanna get into assignments yet. So we'll just give an example. You've dropped a lot, place last seen, and uh, I'm gonna add the command post down here. So just so people can see, I can drop a pin on, add a map note, so this is the command post. And I can pick from a whole set of um, icons here. I can go through lots of them. We'll put it in uh, red. Okay, so there's the command post drawn on as well. So you can see, very simple to draw on. I'm just gonna draw a line to show you that as well. So put in an access road. Okay, so I've drawn this road on here and Kyle's actually added a search radius here as well, um, which you can see this green uh circle overlaying okay so at this point we uh we're starting to get our 
um, our map coming together. I'm just going to jump back over to this layer here. Let's let's we're gonna you're gonna see this map all come back around as we start to add assignments out and some of the pieces. So so stand by on here and we'll you'll, you're gonna see this come through. So we're next on to the log. Now the log is where you're gonna keep your whole set of actions, decisions, anything that happened. So for example, I could say uh, command post set up at Come on, put set up at uh, farm A. Okay. And you can see that post has come in. Kyle, you might just drop in a post as well. That's come in timestamp now. Um, every, um, you can see it, uh, that everybody's going to be able to post in here who's got permission to do so. So you can see here incident commander en route to ICP, ETA 15 minutes. And I might have an update. The IC has arrived. Okay, uh, briefing at three o'clock. Okay, so you can kind of see how this is starting to come together. We're building out this log. And as the incident progresses and everybody has their own log as well, you're going to see everything merging up into here. So like the map, you're going to see this all come around in a circle through here. Okay, more updates coming in. And the other, the other piece to some of these updates, that last one that I've just put up on the screen there, um, I was able to tag the operations error director. So instead of just having a never ending list of, of logs, you can see there on the screen, Robin's starting to, to tag someone. So you can tag people, you can tag roles, um, lots of different options there. So when you start searching after one, two, three days, maybe you're able to filter out all of that data to look for specific pieces that were directed to that air operations director. You can also drop media in, so you can press upload a file, drop in photos, maps, anything you want to add to this log, but it's, it ends up with your time stamped chronological log of all actions and decisions. Okay, and then I can see Robin. Sorry, yeah. You just added a, you just added a, a notification there as well. The the briefing for fifteen hundred. Yeah. So that bar, that orange bar that's shown up at the the top of the screen there, that's a, a notification that's that's going to every person who's involved in this incident right now. Uh, I got it on my computer here, and I also got it on my mobile device uh, because I've got the app open here. So I got a notification saying that there's a, a briefing at X time. So really great to be able to send data to to people in the in the search or in the incident, um, and they're not necessarily having to see it here on the the log. Absolutely, I've got the uh, mobile app open here as well. And what I was going to do, we might do it towards the end, is we will. Uh, take a look together at what it looks like. So I'll bring up my screen and we'll jump into the same incident because uh, it's a really good example uh, when you see it at the end. Okay, so checklists are next. So because we picked missing person at the start, a search, it's automatically created these two checklists. And I can see there's 11 actions here and eight actions here. And if I click into initial action plan, we can see there's two of them in progress. Kyle's just completed this literally as we're working. Kyle, you feel free to work through. Do you want to complete that whole uh, set of tasks? So Kyle's basically going in here and clicking complete on each of them. And we can actually see his progress here on the outside. So we're watching as he completes through. And if you imagine not just one person, but your entire uh, command team working away on tasks, you start to see all of their different roles completing their actions. So we'll jump into search planning here now, and you're gonna get an idea of how this log works. So um, build a search profile. So I'm gonna double click into this task and we'll say it's in progress. Kyle, you might join me over here in uh, build search profile. I'm gonna yeah. open the log. Okay, what's our profile look like? Um, so I'm going to say here at Kyle is currently building the profile and we'll post it in the subject profile in 
10 minutes time. Okay. This update has gone in against this task. I'm going to assign it to the IC. Okay. Um, and we can see here that's in progress. Determine the search area. I can double click in. I can say um, search area is five kilometer radius from last known point. I'm actually gonna give this to the operations chief just as an example. We'll say this is complete. Okay, so you can see us starting to work through these. And everyone will already have their tasks assigned. So we're kind of just stepping through it uh, um, together here, just so you can kind of see. But all of these things can be pre-assigned out on that play. We're, uh, we're working in tandem here. Okay, so you can see all these updates coming in, and they're related to tasks. So if I go back and look at the main updates log, they're appearing in here too. So under build a search profile, I can see Kyle's working on that. Under uh, build search profile, Kyle's posted profile now updated in forms, which was the, the form we looked at earlier. Okay. Um, we've got search area is five kilometers from the radi radius from the last known point on the determined search area. So what starts to happen is as you work through your checklists here, you'll start to see everything completing up. And the, the really big thing again is because the, the software is so customizable is you can build out whatever checklist you, you feel is appropriate. Um, if you've got a, a helicopter specific program and you've got uh, specific um, legislated or, or required checklists to go through, you can build those in here. Um, very basic and simple things like a, a vehicle pre-trip checklist before the vehicle goes out. Um, you can start assigning some of those as well to, to certain people that are going to be vehicle operators. Um, so you can you can build out these checklists essentially indefinitely for for as much data as you want. And then likewise, you can you can add tasks on the on the fly as well. So it doesn't have to be that pre-populated um, checklist. Um, you're able to add um, pieces to that checklist or a full new checklist uh, right there in your incident as well if you if you have things that come up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you can see Robin doing on the, the screen there is he's built a, a vehicle checklist and added two tasks in that. Uh, so again, quick and easy to, to add that as we're as we're going through our incident, getting ready starting to, to populate data there. Okay, so you're starting to get the idea of how this all works out. We can see our progress start going through. We're gonna to jump to assignments next. So you can see here, it's automatically built out operation assign area assignments. So let's start in ground operations. So I can actually create a new operate, new assignment. You'll see here when I go in, uh, that these forms are just like the ones you saw uh, before. Okay, so um, new assignment, I'm gonna say uh, search area, or say search forest area. And you can see a little call sign will be A1, search period one, you can timestamp it now. Uh, let me just hit refresh on this. Okay. So, um, Kyle, can you see my... Uh, yeah, I got here? it here. Yeah, perfect. So I'd be working through this as a, um, through these, these assignments. Search along... Okay, so you can see this filling out. You've just put members in, have you? Yeah, no, I'll add in a few there. Yep. So you can see Kyle's working on this. It's a really good example of Kyle filling this in. So. As we're working away here, you can see Kyle has added 
Aaron, Chris, Kalen. See Chris's navigation. We can edit this together. Um, and see how powerful this is to collect information together. These are map fields. So, and again, remember that everything that we're looking at here, um, you can entirely customize these. These so. You know, it's not a case that you're stuck with these templates. Now, these these are just example templates that we can give you uh, preloaded. Yeah, and I think there's there's three options there. There's a, a map point, a map area, and a file. Um, so if you're using another GIS tool to to create maps, you can load that there. Or if you've got a, a trail map of the area, you can load that there. Um, Robin just created both the map point and the map area. So the map point is going to be your, your coordinates or your location. This is where the team needs to go to, to start their task or their assignment. And then that map area is going to outline in much more detailed terms what their actual search area is going to be once they get there. Yeah, absolutely. I just hit print on this so we can see what we can now hand out. And I think one of the, the handy things, again, we'll talk about the, the mobile app in a bit. Um, Robin's just printed the form there. Um, but one of the other features we touched on briefly earlier was the, the share by public link. So one thing that we do with all of our search assignments is we'll provide that public link to the team leader of each team. And that way, if, if something changes, we're able to update their team assignment form um, on, on the fly. So instead of having to deal with reprinting, getting that form to them, we're bringing them in from the field, um, providing them with new information and sending them back out. We can update that information here. Or if one member uh, has come in a little late and they're able to join that team, we can assign them to the, the team information here right in, in the software. And then the team leader on that team sees that next time they open up that public link. So really handy field there as well. Let's look at this. So share by public link. It generates a secret URL, which I can press copy on. And that can be given to any team member. You can then see this live view. No username or password needed, but this form is updated throughout. Kyle, you might um, just add a, Kaylin is team leader there on that form. So Kyle's updated the form. The, the default maps can be selected. That's just a preference um, there that uh, you can choose any base map layer you'd like. Is that so done, I've made Yeah, so I've made a change. So what you'll see is because that, that link is just a static website, Robin's now gone and refreshed it. And you can see that Kaylin has been assigned the assistant team leader role. So every time you update that web page, you're going to see the new data produced there on the form. Yeah. So they're live, live public links to any template. So even it might be a weather report. And the other, the handy thing to those is that if after that team assignment is done, or if you use if you use that as a as an opportunity to share a media release, if you've got concerns that uh, it's being shared outside of the people that it should be shared with, or if if it's no longer accurate data, you can revoke or shut down that private or that public link, and then as soon as that person refreshes that page again, that data is no longer accessible. So you've got complete control over your data, whether it's shared within the software or whether it's shared by that public link. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to draw. On a river search here. It's capturing the range of the river. OK. So um, what I want to show you here now is we've now got two ground operations. OK, we've a uh, search forest area and we have a search river and i can from within the forest area i can open the log here on the right and i might get an update from this assignment so uh these guys say uh departing on assignment now we'll say team alpha i can actually tag them as well team
purchase made according on it. Uh, that has now been logged in against search forest area. Now I might press back and I'm going to search river. And I'll put an update here. Uh, river search will commence at 2 p.m. Okay. And then I might go back and I get another update from search forest area. And look, actually, there's an update come in. Search team A radio check 55. Okay. So um, you can see here that we can keep logs on everything. So we can keep a log on a role. We can keep a log on an assignment. We can keep a log on um, a checklist item. And as we click around, follow me logging, as it's called, uh, will, will show me what's relevant. So when I'm back at all assignments, I see any post about any of the, the sections. If I click into ground operations, I see any post about ground operations. And if I click into a particular assignment, it filters again to show me only posts about that assignment. Obviously, this is very powerful as there's lots of users start working away in their areas, inputting data. And I think the other the other piece to this in the, the ICS structure is we talk about things like position logs. So you're able to start logging all of that information, not to an individual, um, but to that person or to that position, sorry. So here we can see um, we're able to filter out everything um, that's been said to the operations chief, anything that's been tagged there or to each individual assignment. So if we're, if we're curious what's, what's happened or if you've stepped into a new position and you're curious what's happened the last operational period in your specific role, um, you're able to start looking at that information in the log and filter it out. Instead of having the, the cluttered view of, of all of the updates and trying to pick out what is specific to you, you're able to filter that. So really beneficial to have that position log data accessible to you as well. So yeah, I can search here for everything in operations. I log against operations. Oh, I can search for everything for the ops chief. So you can filter these logs again and again. Or you can just keyword search. I me all radio checks. Okay. Kyle, did you just post another radio check uh, five of five? So I'm. I've, these are active search filters. So I've just got the search radio done automatically when Kyle posts this. Uh, we should get that appearing if you uh, mention the word radio. Yep, you got one there. I may need to we'll search down. Hold on a second. There it is. So anything mentioning radio. Okay, we've got a question in here from Tommy on Facebook. Um Tommy is asking, can this platform work without any internet connection for the duration of the mission? Good question. So no, it, it is it is a cloud-based internet platform. So it does require that you have the internet for initiating the incident, creating the channel. And also um, it, it, it's going to, but uh, it's going to need to shut down and everything. But while once you're started up, you can, as a user, move out of Signal and continue to post content and interact with the content. And when yeah, you get so back into Signal, the, it's going to sync again. So for us on the, the search and rescue side of things, um, depending on where that search is, there may or may not be connectivity for, for both the, the command staff or the, the teams in the field. So for those teams going out, as long as they've opened up, be it the, the web interface or they've opened up the app, they're able to interact with that data. Um, they're able to see their team assignment form. They're able to log things like clues. Um, and then when they get back into connectivity, that's all uploaded onto the cloud. Likewise, any data that was created by anyone else is then uploaded to, to their account as well. So uh, works really well for, for times of, of intermittent connectivity, um, as long as you're able to, to access it at the very beginning, the very be end, then, then you're good to go. Yeah, so it's designed for low quality internet, we'll call it, not no internet. Um, and and 
Yeah, and, and uh, Tommy's just a second follow-up here saying, there are a lot of ways. This problem of internet connectivity is reducing. Um, we set out to design this uh, so it seems seamless within that. Um, but internet connectivity is becoming, it can be expensive, but it's becoming less and less. It is not a technical challenge anymore to achieve it, while sometimes expensive. Absolutely. And even on the expensive side of things, there's a, there has been a couple tests that have been done by SAR groups in BC around really how much data usage is being used. Um, so we've, we've we're used the software quite reliably on satellite data. Um, I think Robin's just able to pull up there actually how much data is going back and forth, but significantly low amounts of data is used for the, the software. So if, you use, if you're concerned about cellular data usage, or if you are using um, satellite data as well, it's, it's quite limited in the amount of data back and forth. So it allows you to, to utilize those tools and not receive an astronomical bill at the end of an incident. Yeah, absolutely. So this this is the channel we're in at the moment. Um, so I think it looks to me like we've created 2.7 megabytes of data there. But from that point on, this is all synced. Um, and so there is nothing, there is nothing, it's it's not, there's no, there's no extra data pull down when I change screen. Um, so there's no bandwidth used at this point. This is all accessing my offline data. Um, it's only when new data is pushed to me. So Kyle adds a change in a form or adds a new form. That's the only time. So you can browse around without using any data um, at any point. Okay, so we've started now filling out the um, some two assignments there. What I want to show you is we can bring the map up here. And like when the log was, I'm going to get a better layer here. Uh, if you can see it slightly better. Um, like when the log was, yeah, that's better color. Um, I'm just going to delete your radius. Okay. So like when the log was uh, on the right and filtered, we're now looking at a search assignments. So you can see the search river and search forest area assignments in this zone. And you can see it goes green. Kyle, you might just start the river one, mark the search river as in progress. It's gone amber. Okay. And all of these feed back in. So I can go back to the main map here and I'm starting to see assignments. I can also draw another assignment on. So if I wanted these buildings searched, I can go straight here and add an assignment. Put in uh, ground operations as well. And and then I've got that here on my side in the, the search out buildings, and I'm able to, to start adding data to that right away. So Robin's created it in the in the map, and then I can go and start developing more data into that as it's needed. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so you can see how this all comes together um, as we begin to see all of our uh, operations completing off. We've only one left. Uh, and our incident starting to step through. Now, if we were, if this was an incident we were doing, we might come up with some scenarios. So uh, let's have a look at this. So I might add a scenario here, lost in forest. Carl, feel free to add a few there in the background. Great related assignments, or I'm just gonna undo some of our assignments. Uh, so let's mark these as not started yet. Um, okay, so will be back. So search the forest area. Um, and then I'm going to drop that on the map that he is probably in this forest here. And then we'll say that this is very likely. Now, when I go back here, I think Kyle will have another one. So he's got Felon River going on. Um, I'm going to add a uh, Rest of world, let's say that this is likely. Okay, so you can kind of see here, I can go group by rating. So now we've got our likely, very likely likelies gone. We'll make this one uh, not very unlikely. Okay, so you can see this all coming together as scenarios. 
And I might want to add another, I'm gonna, because of this uh, river one, I'm gonna add a new assignment. So I'm actually gonna say, we'll add a new assignment here called dive uh, river, just as an example. I'm gonna put in marine ops, create new. And I guess as Robin and I are going through this, I mentioned earlier is right now because of COVID, it's made things difficult for, for people to come together. But as well, I think for, for my team specifically in the volunteer search and rescue side of things is sometimes you're you're not able to get away from work or you've got an appointment that you, you can't miss, but you still, you're still able to be involved and, and support an incident or an operation. So on the planning side of things, your planning director and really your whole planning team can be removed from the incident command post. They can be in a separate location, um, not interrupted by everything else going on and able to to focus on on what they have to do to, to build the, the plan for that incident. So um, what you're seeing here with Robin and I building out some of those scenarios, that's all stuff that, again, because it's cloud-based interactive software is you can be, be absolutely anywhere in the world as Prove to Robin and I as we're building data here, and it's still showing up live for that incident command team who is on scene. I'm gonna add a helicopter flyover a river as well, just to put something in air. So you can see my, um, you can kind of see my fell in river likely scenario has three tasks associated with it now, and I can click straight into any of those and see where they're at. You can see lost in forest has one task associated with it. All of this is coming back to our map, so you can see we're just drawing over each other here. Um, but you can see this all building out uh, as we go. Okay, everything coming together. And um, the same are assignments. You can start to see what's still left to do. Honey dive is completed. Okay, we found a clue. Kyle, you might um, find a shoe. Yeah. So the, the useful thing as we're, we're building this is this allows data from the field uh, to, be, to be brought in instead of having to wait for someone to take a picture or send an email. Uh, you've got all that data live there being sent to the incident command team. So as Kyle's working there, once he's got this entered, it just appears. I'm doing nothing on my side, so I can see a running shoe has been found. And I can actually, I can click into this running shoe um, to see what's going on here. Okay, and yeah, you can attach a photo, you can print this off and it's all filtered back. You can see it's on our main map here as well now. And then if you, if you feel that, so we're starting to add a lot of data to the map, what Robin's able to do is, is filter out um, and remove any of those team assignments or remove those clues if they're not valid to what you're looking at on the map as well. So again, able to, to pick and choose what you're after if you've got a number of clues that when you look at your map, it seems to, to clutter it up, you're able to remove those if you need to in some of the layers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you can see how your clues will build out. Of course, all these forms are customizable. Um, build whatever way you'd like these to be or build your own boards. Um, we've got some other pieces. There's a question in before we do, uh, Nathan, can clues be added by teams in the field? Well, this is a perfect chance to show you the mobile app. So let's jump there now. So while Robin's getting the, the mobile app started, so this is absolutely how, how we use this in, in my team is we've either got a, a smartphone or a tablet, we've got team devices and personal devices. So everybody's able to, to log in um, and send data back and forth. So um, you'll see with, with Robin's phone in a minute here, once it comes up is I'm as a field team, I'm able to, to take a picture with my phone, um, right away there it's it's got that picture and it's loaded that back to the incident command team likewise it's going to use the gps in my phone to log where i was um, so really quick and easy to to share information from the fields back to your command team okay so what we've got here is you can see so we're looking here at 
the mobile app here. So this is my live phone, okay? And I click into situation, I'm in this incident, and I'm looking at the exact same situation report uh, that we built at the start, okay? So I'm able to see everything going on here. I should be able to get into all my plans. There's my subject profile we discussed. You can see it's locked already because I signed it up. There's Kyle on the, uh, the photo. Very good. And you can see it's probably signed off there as well at the bottom. Okay, so I'm able to get into everything here. Now, um, I'll just do a quick demonstration here through the different screens. Here's my log and uh, update from the field. And I can press the attachment button there, it'll open my camera, um, and I can take a photo straight into the app as well. And all these are coming. Kyle, could you just even type in the word test there in the updates? Yep, and it's come straight up on my phone. Okay, so the question was, can we see, add a clue? So running shoe, I'm gonna add a bag. I could take a photo, I'll hit location. Now I'm gonna have to uh, come over to the other side of the world here for you. Uh, we were in Victoria. Okay. Uh, where were we to there, Kyle? A little, a little further west. Suki. Is that right? Yeah, got it. Yep, right in there. Okay, so I'm just going to drop it up here. So I can hit the, um, I can hit my location uh, and it'll drop it straight on my GPS. So uh, it's not a case that, um, it's not a case that, you have to have, uh, you, you have to type in the address. You can search for address, but you can just drop it on your GPS location. Let me find a color. It's really odd that there's no color imagery in the one place you picked. Um, I'm gonna zoom in here just to give you an example of how good the imagery is normally everywhere else, okay? So there's normally no problem with getting good quality imagery. Okay, so let's save on my location. Relevancy, hi. Time found, it'll timestamp it to right now. Action taken with clue, um, bagged and carried, marker left. Okay, so that's me just adding it on the uh, on the app. Kyle, could you just change that relevancy to, to maybe low on that bag? And we'll see it on my, there you go, medium, okay? And so you can see straight away, my phone is absolutely live with everything else. And so I've added a ring shoe, or we've now a running shoe in a bag on our clue list. I can see our scenarios, so lost in forest. Who was it, the Felon River? I can see the associated, let's have a look at the uh, search river task. So again, like Rob, like we've said, is that to be able to have access to this data, again, because Robin's opened up the app, um, he's got complete, we'll call it offline access now that he's he's opened it up. So he can he can use his phone or his device, even if he doesn't have uh, cellular service or connectivity, he can add information to that channel. Um, he can upload his clues, take pictures, add GPS information, and then once he gets back into connectivity, uh, I've got all that as well. So as Robin changes and adds data here live on his on his phone on the app, I'm seeing that right here on my screen as well. So completely collaborative, completely interactive, um, not just within your your command team setting up things, um, developing paperwork, um, but also with the the teams or the people in the field. You've got uh, complete connectivity with them and the the ability to to interact and and build data for an incident. Traditionally, you'd wait for you'd either get a, a call over the radio and transcribe something and probably make a mistake in your string of UTM or lat long coordinates. Now you've got all of that coming direct from the scene to your incident command team to be able to make the most appropriate decisions for for the incident. Kyle, sounds like you've got a wild animal in the background. <laughs> I do, I do. 
It's uh, he's deciding that it's lunchtime on me. <laughs> the baby was mine earlier, wasn't? Uh, <laughs> do that one to you. Okay, so you can see um, from the um, from my phone there, you've got full uh, control. So I hope that answers that. Let's go back again to the main application. We'll actually have a quick look at that clue. So the bag is what I added from my phone and you can see it here okay. i think while we're on the map here um there's one other question in the the chat there robin around loading um gps tracks so absolutely you can you can pull in all of that data as well um so when when we're in the map um you're able to to add multiple different layers including um data from your gps so team comes into the field, whatever device they've they've used, um, be it a handheld GPS or if they've got a track saved from their phone, uh, they can send that to you. You can load that right into, into the software here. And so the other, other cool thing, and we'll talk about kind of mapping for a, a minute here, is everything that's loaded here in the incident management software, um, you're also going to see later on down the road in in your in the other side in your other D4H account when you go and complete this is all of this map data is now in your your archive. Um, it's it's there to be able to to view to review as needed as well. So you don't necessarily lose the functionality of the map. It doesn't just go back to being a file. You're able to view it visually um, throughout all of the different pieces of software the D4H has. Excellent. Yeah. So full, full interoperability there. Um, it's quite a lot of people. We covered SAR Topo. We had uh, the guys on from SAR Topo um, just before the holidays. And uh, you can see in their software that they're, they're mapping specialists and there's some really detailed, fantastic mapping tools. Um, and I know a lot of people use both. And um, so while their management might be going on over here, they've got some detailed mapping going on in the other piece. You can import and export KML files or uh, from both, um, so that they're, they're they're interoperable. We'd love to make that a little bit more automatic. Okay, so finally, there's kind of a couple of other little tools here. Um, just before we move on, these these are your task boards. These are your status boards. You can build your own status boards too. If you want to create a new uh, status board here called Air Assets, or um, you know helicopters and you have helicopter one two and three and you want to add them and there's a form for each and you've got a running log for each and you've got them on a map that's you can build all of that so it's entirely customizable and easy to do that uh, so you can build out any board you'd like okay and turn them on and off within your account robin just want to throw up the screen share yep absolutely there we go sorry about that okay so um Let's uh, let's jump onto the kind of ancillary tools because we set the location and it knows the time. It currently you know, is it raining there, Kyle? Yeah, we're it is. It is. Yeah. So, and that's one of the the cool pieces on the the weather side of things as well is the the ways that you can interact with this. So, Robin's popped up just kind of the the quick dashboard for for weather, but you'll notice on the left hand side of Robin's screen there. Um, he can open up the bigger picture weather to look at the, the full forecast. He's also just clicked on the, the add to log. So now if, if there's a decision point that's being made for, for safety, that we know it's raining, the river is going to come up, we're pulling our teams out of the field, we can add the weather direct to the log for that decision point to be able to have our justification later on down the road if we need it. And then what we've got on the screen now is that, that long-term forecast. So we can look ahead and say, okay, Tomorrow looks like weather's going to improve. We're going to restart operations at that point, depending on what we need to do. So really powerful to be able to have the weather built into your, your incident management tool to be able to make decisions on the fly. Yeah. V visibility and improves precipitation drops, but wind increases. You can see the red here. You had a westerly. And you've got some wind through until Thursday, 2 a.m. Library allows you to add any of your documents or bookmarks in. So uh, these are just sample files, but uh, you would you would be able to add, upload any of your manuals, guides, PDFs on here. Because we picked missing person search at the start, it's determined what's in this folder. Okay, you can also have any bookmarks. 
So these can be uh, linking to special sites, weather stations, um, whatever you want, other systems you have. Your SAR topo link, for example, could be in here. I think where, where Robin's talking about, because we picked missing person search at the very beginning, this is where, again, we talk about how customizable the, the software is, is we've built out, this is where all of our pre-plans are. So the, the big piece to to search and rescue to any incident response is the reevaluation phase to to look at what happened to improve upon it and to, to make your operations better for next time. So each incident that we have gets built into our, our pre-plans. So we know that if we have a, a search in McDonald Park down the street, uh, we we open up and right away we've got um, search assignments already pre-built in there. We've got we know these are the best locations for our command posts. So we could we don't have to rebuild all of that information. So that's again the the really strong piece to the software is after an incident we're able to bring it back if we feel it appropriate, build a pre-plan from the data that's already been created, and then we have access to that data down the road. So in the beginning, when we clicked on either missing person search or rescue, in that channel selection option, we've got a number of pre-plans for different locations uh, within our search and response area as well. So really good to be able to have all of that. And it's quick, it's live, it's accessible to you as you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've just had some information come in live about Starlink um, that you're looking for. This is the new satellite internet connections that seem to be coming. Um, the info posted here to us was it'll cost 99 per month. So a thousand something dollars per year. I think it's super fast. Um, I don't know if you know the speeds, but I think it's super fast um, with an initial $499 fee for a Starlink kit, which gives you a connection, ground terminal, tripod, and Wi-Fi router. So that is looking very promising for command units. Um, my understanding is that's going to be fantastic uh, when it comes in. Yeah, no, a great tool. I think the, the as connectivity grows and, and increases, which we know it will, um, tools like D4H incident management are, are just going to become more and more invaluable. Um, Robin's flipping back to the, the dashboard there now. And this is that that quick overview, um, and again, that invaluable data as a as a search manager and an incident manager to be able to have that overview. Um, we can see the log, we can see that as it's populating. Um, we've got a quick view at our map, and then lots of other data on there. We can see um, we've got four um, incident assignments that haven't been started, um, but likewise, we've got one in progress and one complete there. Um, we can see all of our 16 of our checklists have been completed. So really quick and easy to, to be able to view this. And if you've got this set up in an incident command post or in your, your building at your EOC, for example, your operations center, you're able to pick and choose um, where these are and what's displayed. So maybe um, we've got some, some information on the log that is needs to be secure and we don't want the log up on the screen, we can remove that from our dashboard and just show some of the other pieces. So you're able to completely customize it as to, to what you want to see, which is, is incredibly beneficial for, for the incident planning side of things, but as well just to have that quick visual to look up at the screen and see here's what's going on with my incident. Yeah, absolutely. Kyle, would you mind just going into checklists and just completing all of the remaining actions because it, it lights up this this dashboard. You'll kind of start seeing everything moving. Um, it really is real time. So you can see there the green lines, search planning, everything's starting to move up. So you can project these up on the wall um, and it'll give you an overview of everything happening. Yeah, so there we go. There's all of our, all of our checklists complete now. Um, and we can see that there on Robin's screen, completely filled in. Um, we're we're starting to yeah we're, we're we're starting to wrap up here so we'll take any last questions I can this one's for you I think so, Kyle yeah so the Radams tool is a is a risk assessment tool that was developed specifically by uh, the BC, BC Search and Rescue Association and Steve your question there is can Radams be integrated into the team assignments absolutely so. Um, from a very basic form, um, you could create a, a data field that asks what was your RADAMS assessment number. Um, and this is something that I'm, I'm happy to share with some of the BC teams is we've got a, a 
task tool built specifically for that. It doesn't necessarily do the math yet, but that's something that we're working on where um, our, our risk score is, is three and, and that starts to populate. That'll show in a different color to identify some high risk versus low risk um, assignments as well. So absolutely it can be, be integrated and that comes to just how customizable D4H incident management is is you're able to, to build and change whatever you like, whatever fields you need, whatever forms, whatever tools and processes you need to make your operation run. It's quick and easy to build that. As you can see on the screen there, Robin's adding that quite quickly here. I'm just picking this up. It's probably not correct, but uh, I'll give you the idea. Okay, so our team assignment should now have that field on it. Let's go have a look. Um, and assignments. So I'm going to ground operations. We'll do the river search. So I should have a new risk section. There you go. Risk rating. I don't know how you, um, it's a, it's a number, is it? And then yes. No. Okay. So you can see here, uh, very easy to customize the, the forms. So I hope that answers that. Um, how easy is it to import data from Sarman by IPA? Do you know anything on that, Kyle? I don't, unfortunately, no. I think um, there's a number of different import tools and functionalities built into the incident management software, um, depending on kind of how that tool is being used for the IPA um, for your incident action plan, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, I'm wondering is Sarman, I, 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 if uh okay so plymouth so i'm gonna guess uh oh sorry api sorry so saying uh it's sarman by api so i'm guessing sarman is the mappy x it's a uk based uh software based on that saying Ply plymouth I, th I th i'm guessing here uh that's what you're talking about um can it be pulled in uh, we need to see the specific data likelihood what you're going to do if it's if it's um likelihood you're going to import in a spreadsheet so for example i can go to my volunteers list and i can go import and i can select a file and i can take in a csv file and import it in here uh, or maybe it's a mapping file and like kyle covered earlier i can go import a layer and i can select my file here uh, geojson kml kmz shape files so it, it depends what that data is but you can import and export in that manner yeah okay so um that that's really the very quick overview i think uh thank a big 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 thank you to kyle for joining um that has been fantastic to have your knowledge um, uh, um and talking through this and putting real context on it for people of how yeah. d4h incident management works Glad to glad to have the conversation. Glad to share some of the experiences that I've had, and really, I want to thank you and the the engineering team for for continuing to build an amazing piece of of software that has really changed how how I and my team kind of view incident management within within our our incidents. It's it's been great to see it from from the very beginning, and there's continual changes and update updates made, which are, are really just making our job as incident managers much easier. So it's a fantastic tool, and and highly recommended from our oh. team. Well, thank you very much, Kyle. That's very good of you. For for people listening, we this uh, this series that we do this live stream series, it goes out on YouTube. It goes out on Facebook and it goes out on Twitter, Periscope, all live. Um, I can see we've had good numbers watching throughout. And thank you for staying with us. A audio only version goes out on all the podcast platforms. So it's called the Bravo Zulu podcast. It goes out on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, where, wherever you listen to your podcast, you'll find it. Um, so there's an audio only version. And if you are listening to that audio only version, you will have missed some of the screen sharing, but you've probably heard a lovely story um, of how technology is being used in search and rescue. So um, we'll wrap up here and say thank you very much. Thank you again uh, to Kyle. Um, there's lots of thanks coming in for Kyle uh, from everybody here. So uh, thank you again, Kyle. And uh, we will uh, see you soon.
Absolutely. Take care, Robin. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.